My name is Jordan Flanders. I'm the founder of the Food Law and Policy Society here. Um, this is our inaugural event. Um, I'm here to introduce uh, the moderator, uh, Priya Fielding Singh. She's a third year PhD student in sociology studying US food and environmental movements. Um, she cur currently works as a health educator in the Pacific Free Medical Clinic in East San Jose, where she educates patients from underserved populations about effective changes they can make um, around diet and exercise. Uh, she serves as co-director of the Slow Food Childhood Obesity Bay Conference, um, Bay Area Conference, and she's the co-chair and founder of the Stanford Food Forum, I think many of you are a part of, um, which is a student group aimed at facilitating interdisciplinary dialogue around food system issues. Um, she hopes that her work will identify solutions for transforming our current inequitable food system while simultaneously contributing to a broader discussion about social equity and justice. Thank you. And then microphones. those microphones are okay. Oh, okay, great. All right, well, thank you all for coming today. Uh, and thank you to Jordan and the Stanford Food Law and Policy Society for hosting this event. Uh, I think we can all agree that today's event couldn't come at a more opportune moment. Uh, after two plus years of Congress stalling and failing to pass a new farm bill, it looks like the time may have actually arrived. Uh, the House passed it last week. The Senate supported it yesterday with a vote of 60 to 32, and now it's on its way to Obama's desk where he is expected to sign it on Friday. Uh, but what, what exactly does the Farm Bill do? Uh, for any brave soul who's ever dared to dig into what the Washington Post calls the most hideously complex piece of legislation out there, uh, you've probably found yourself getting lost in the almost 1,000 pages of information explaining where about a trillion dollars uh, is being allocated. So the bill covers everything from food stamps and nutrition to commodity programs, crop insurance, conservation, and even international food aid. Uh, among the biggest changes to the newest bill are substantial cuts to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, otherwise known as SNAP, the expansion of the crop insurance program, and the elimination of direct payments to farmers. Uh, to help us decode the bill, and to offer us some insight into what some of those changes mean for our health, uh, for the environment, for low-income communities and small farmers. Uh, we couldn't have put together a better panel of experts uh, to talk to us today. So each panelist has prepared about, ten, about a 10-minute presentation uh, tackling a different myth about the Farm Bill. And afterwards, I will ask a round of questions, and then I'll open it up to you for audience Q&A. But first, let me start by introducing the panelists. So to my immediate right is Margot Pollins. Margot is the Resnick Program for Food Law and Policy Teaching Fellow at the UCLA School of Law. Her primary research interests lie in the areas of food and agriculture law, public interest environmental law, and land use and property law. A graduate of NYU Law School, Margot was the lead attorney on litigation at the Institute for Public Representation at Georgetown University, as well as the lead attorney on a range of administrative projects, including comments on the Clean Air Act and Food Safety Modernization Act rulemakings. Today, Margo is going to debunk some of the widespread myths surrounding SNAP participation. To Margo's right is David Lazarus, who is not only a third year uh, student here at Stanford Law School, but also a pre-doctoral fellow at the Center on Food Security and the Environment. Uh, today, David brings to us the perspective of someone who's actually worked in the federal government on food and agriculture issues. So before coming to law school, he served as legislative assistant to Illinois Senator Dick Durbin, where he worked on the 2008 Farm Bill. Most recently, David has served as senior advisor to the Secretary of Agriculture and as a detailee to the White House Domestic Policy Council. And today, he's going to enlighten us about the political economy surrounding the assembly of the Farm Bill and the political process behind its passage. And finally, to David's right is Christine Fry. Christine is a senior policy analyst and program director at Change Lab Solutions, which is an Oakland-based organization specializing in providing community-based solutions to public health problems. Christine has written extensively on public health policy with an emphasis on food and agriculture issues, including the Farm Bill and the impact of restaurant and retail policy on public health. She's also the co-founder of the Healthy Farms, Healthy People Coalition, a national network of public health and agriculture leaders working to create a healthier food system for farmers, workers, and consumers. Today, Christine is going to tackle a couple of pervasive myths about farm bill subsidies. 
And with that, I will turn it over to Christine. All right. Is this on? OK. Thank you, um, everybody, for coming. This was great. Standing room. Um, and thank you, Jordan, for organizing um, this great and very timely talk. Um, so I am from Change Lab Solutions. It's a, a local nonprofit that works nationally with communities and states on policy and law to create healthier places to live. Um, I focus on obesity prevention, um, and in particular, food policy and healthy food retail, um, sugar-sweetened beverage regulation. Uh, the soda tax up in San Francisco is, is a hot topic right now. Um, but one tiny little piece of my work is um, looking at how public health can be more involved um, in agriculture policy, and in particular, the Farm Bill. And this interest um, came about for our organization uh, about four years ago when um, some colleagues at the Yale Law School actually invited us to um, co-sponsor and co-organize a day-long convening of health and agriculture advocates to talk about um, potential collaboration in the what was going to be the next farm bill, which would have been 2012, and now, of course, it was basically yesterday's farm bill, what we were talking about. Um, and at the time, the people in the agriculture community were um, thought we were crazy. Uh, they were First of all, they were like, why, what do you guys have to do with the farm bill? And second of all, we just passed the farm bill in 2008. Why are we talking about this? This is you know, at least three years away. Um, and, but there was a, were a lot of good conversations, and it became very clear that the interest of health, of increasing access to healthy food, and um, reducing consumption of more processed foods and junk food um, aligned with a lot of the work that was happening in conservation circles and um, on the farm bill in um, the family farm community, the small and medium-sized farm communities. And so um, over the last few years, um, through this coalition that I co-founded and, um, and just through my day-to-day -day work, I've been trying to help people, particularly in communities, understand what the farm bill actually means to them, even if they're um, living in an urban community. So um, I'm going to tackle one topic that came up quite a bit um, as I started to move into obesity prevention and then to focus on the farm bill, and that's the link between corn subsidies and obesity. Um, and my subtitle is that I'm having a one-sided fight with Michael Pollan because um, I would largely blame this myth on him, um, but he doesn't know I exist, so that's why it's just me versus <laughs> him ignoring me. Um, so. So it would inevitably come up that I'd meet someone at a party and they would say, and I would tell them I work in obesity prevention, um, food policy in particular, and suddenly I was talking to an agricultural economist. Every, no matter if they were a computer programmer or an electrical engineer, suddenly they knew a lot about agriculture policy because they'd start with, <laughs> have you read Michael Pollan? And I'd say, yes, I have. And then they'd say, what we really need to do to fix obesity is eliminate these corn subsidies. The federal government is subsidizing obesity. And I'd say, OK, yes. And he'd be like, high fructose corn syrup. It's an everything. And it was just the you know, <laughs> downhill from there. <laughs> so, And I have to admit that I have been the other person in this conversation before I got into this. Um, but I started to hear, you know, I'd hear this a lot. I read it myself. And there was, there was often no citation to any kind of research between, that showed this connection. And so I became very skeptical. Um, and, and that's what I'm going to tell you about in a moment. But first, um, I assume that you have heard there's an obesity epidemic in this country. Um, obesity rates have risen uh, over the last 40 years. And now we have one in three children overweight or obese, and two in three um, adults are overweight or obese. And this is costing our economy um, billions of dollars a year in lost productivity and healthcare costs associated with obesity. And it's really not the weight that we care about. It's the, all of the things that come with it. Um, diabetes rates go up, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, depression. It brings all of these diseases that will shorten lifespans and generally um, you know, limit quality of life. Um, for, for most of people's lifetimes. And that's what we really care about in public health, is trying to prevent that. So there are many um, things that have led, to, led us to this point. 
Um, but a big contributor is diet. Our, our diets have changed quite substantially in, in the last probably 50 years. Um, we eat about 200 to 300 more calories on average per day, but we're not more physically active um, over that same time period. Kids are eating fast food on a daily basis. A pretty big chunk of kids are doing that. Um, fast food, highly processed foods, which generally are high in calories, high in fat, high in all the stuff we don't want people eating, and low in fruits and vegetables and all the things that are promoting health. And we can attribute a pretty big, um, a relatively big proportion of um, the rise in obesity to one particular type of product. Any guesses what that is? Sugary drinks, sugary drinks exactly. Um, there's a growing body of research linking sugar sweetened beverage consumption to obesity, um, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, a whole range of um, health problems. So people know this in the sort of popular media, and they read Michael Pollan, and he draws some lines for them. So we know that the federal government subsidizes corn um, and other grains and some oil seed crops. Um, we know that junk food is really cheap and has a lot of calories and it's not good for us. And we know that obesity rates are um, very high. And so Michael Pollan's book and other popular writers in food uh, say, that, there, that the subsidies cause junk food to be cheap, or a contributor to how cheap it is, and that because of that, people are eating too much of it, and then um, they're getting overweight, and our obesity rates are soaring. So I'm, I don't take um, much exception to the, the second connection. Um, we do know that price drives people's choices, and so um, there, is, there is a connection there. Um, but it's, it's that first link that uh, is what I'm going to talk about. So what most people uh, call subsidies in sort of common vernacular is actually um, a particular program called direct payments. Um, there are other ways that the federal government subsidizes uh, farmers, um, but I'm just going to focus on this one because it's what most people are thinking about. It's actually a program that started in 1996. Farm came, uh, was authorized in the 1996 Farm Bill. Um, so it hasn't been happening forever. It's a relatively new uh, program. And it's a subsidy program for, um, for farmers who are farming on land uh, that grows a particular set of commodity crops. So wheat, corn, grain, so on. Um, and farmers receive these payments based on historical production. So if you're not producing corn on your land in this year, you will still receive it if you produced corn on that land in a particular uh, year when, when the program baseline was set. And um, one of the few kind of strings that are attached to this money is that you can't switch crops to um, fruits and vegetable production without losing eligibility for the payments and without um, their penalties on top of that. So why, are, why were we doing this? Um, well, we have to go back to the New Deal era, and actually really farther back, um, to just the beginning of farming, where there's always been this problem of overproduction of crops. Um, because farming is a little bit unique in that you plant a particular crop, um, and if the market prices drop during the growing season, say, um, you can't just stop growing, producing that. You're going to produce it because you've already invested money into it, and, um, and you need to try to recoup what you've invested. And so farmers can't be as responsive to the market signals as producers and other industries are. Um, and so, so this creates what I've read um, be called a, a treadmill, where um, produce, prices might drop in a particular year for whatever reason, um, but the market still gets flooded with the crop, and the price drops even further. Um, and so you have these kind of rock bottom prices, farmers trying to squeeze as much out of their land as they can to, to try to not have a loss, um, and it just results in kind of excess quantity, excess supply, and low prices. So in the New Deal, there were um, some policies that were implemented to try to, to, to try to curb this overproduction. And, um, and so there were land set-aside programs to incentivize farmers to um, stop producing in, when, during periods of low prices. 
Um, there, were, there was a strategic grain reserve where the federal government bought um, uh, excess grain when market prices were low to kind of constrict the supply. And then in high market, uh, high market price years, they would sell it. Um, and actually, this program made the government money because uh, they were buying quite low and selling high. Well, in the 80s and 90s, the, these programs and policies were um, eliminated during a wave of deregulation in the federal government. And um, soon after, uh, farm income market prices plummeted. Um, and so the farmers were back on this treadmill of trying to not um, lose their business and, and trying not to, um, to kind of have uh, lower farm income than they did before. And this didn't look good, um, and it wasn't good for particularly small and medium-sized farmers. And so um, Congress enacted in the 96 Farm Bill emergency payments to prop up farm income, um, and that's the direct payment system. It was supposed to be temporary, um, but in 2002, um, this temporary program became permanent, and um, that's where we got the uh, direct payment program. So, the farmers don't really benefit from this program. Can anyone guess who, who does, though? And who, particularly, who benefits from the, the deregulation in the 80s and 90s? Right. So sort of these middle, middle men who are buying the grain to, for meat production, um, for uh, pro grain processors, um, really benefited from this drop in market prices when deregulation occurred. And um, not surprisingly, they also lobbied very heavily for this policy change. So fi finally, coming back to this myth of subsidies being linked to obesity, um, this, this chart shows um, where a dollar spent on food at a retail level um, goes in terms of everything from the farmer all the people in between that get the, the product to your plate, um, so the different industries that are involved. And as you can see, the most important thing here is this last chunk, which is the amount, the percentage that goes to farmers. And it's about 11 cents or 11%. Um, so the actual inputs to junk food, this raw farm product like corn, um, is a very small percentage of the final retail price that you're paying for that food. And um, so even you know, intuitively thinking about this, drastic changes up or down in that cost has very little effect on the final retail price. Um, and economic modeling has also kind of confirmed what, what we sort of intuitively can figure out from this, which is that, say, a subsidy of um, worth 20% of the value of, of corn, say, um, will reduce the retail price um, of a product made from that corn uh, by only 0.15%. And um, that small, actually, sorry, I'm getting my numbers wrong. It'll reduce the price by 0.3%. Um, and that reduction in price, uh, retail price, will um, only increase consumption by about 0.15%. Um, plus, we have looked at, some researchers have looked at um, historical retail prices and compared that to corn prices and other commodity prices over the same time period. And the two prices, you know, data sets move basically independently. Sometimes retail prices, well, retail prices go up pretty much over time. But, you know, sometimes corn prices are high, retail prices don't really respond. When they're low, retail prices stay the same. So um, there's there's very little correlation between you know, what the middlemen and the processors are paying for the farm product and what you're paying in the grocery store. So in, in closing, um, I should say that this is actually a eulogy because in yesterday's farm bill, um, the direct payments program was eliminated. Um, so we no longer have this, we'll no longer have this program when that um, bill goes into effect. Um, and so if you're looking for something to blame for obesity, I can give you lots of other things. Um, but just in short, what we really care about at Change Lab Solutions is, um, is the environment.
that we're living in and how that's changed over time to make it very difficult to walk and bike, to be physically active. It makes it very difficult to find healthy options, um, particularly if you're living in a low income or underserved community. Um, and there are a lot of policies that have created that, but there are also policies that can change that. So I'm happy to answer questions about that um, at the end. And so um, much of, a lot of what I know about uh, <coughs> subsidies um, is from some research that uh, good colleagues at the Public Health Institute and Food and Water Watch have done. Um, and so I recommend this piece if you want to know more about uh, the direct payments program. And then I have some pieces here, um, including this one, uh, just basic primers into what health has to do with the farm bill and agriculture policy. And that's it. Thank you. So thank you all for coming and having me. I don't have a, a PowerPoint, unfortunately, so I'm going to stay seated. I'm going to talk about two farm bill myths. The, the first is that farm subsidies are good for rural communities. And the second is that in the food stamp or the SNAP program, there are substantial problems with waste, fraud, and abuse. So I'll start with the myth that farm subsidies are good for rural communities. So when I say farm subsidies, I'm including both the direct payments that Christine was talking about and this other set of farm bill programs that essentially guarantee that farmers get particular prices for their commodity crops. So um, whatever the, the actual reasons are that these programs are supported, and I think that David's going to talk about that later, one of the common things that we hear is that these programs are really important because they're essential for the health of, uh, or for the economy of rural communities. And we know that in you know, recent years, a lot of rural communities have been struggling um, in large part um, historically because of farmland consolidation and rural depopulation and other sort of broader economic forces that have made in, you know, finding employment difficult in rural communities. So there's a lot of arguments made that we have to keep a strong subsidy system because without it, these rural communities would be struggling even more. So I want to debunk that myth by thinking about you know, what, what's the basis behind it and, and is there any support for that. So the theory behind the benefit is that this money is given to farmers and then there's a spillover effect. So farmers will then spend that money in their local communities and that there'll be a sort of trickle down of the subsidy money that will support rural economies. The problem is that that's not exactly the way that it works. So studies have suggested that the primary economic effect of these subsidies is actually to raise the value of farmland. So that means that the money doesn't actually end up staying with the farmers. A lot of the money ends up being transferred to landowners. So about 40% of our farmland in this country is rented, not owned, which means that if the value increases, the price of rent goes up, and the, the subsidy money is essentially you know, paid to farmers and then transferred in the form of rent to landowners. Um, so there isn't a, a direct benefit in that sense. The related issue um, is that subsidies are not evenly distributed across farmers across the country. So if we um, wanted to make the argument that this is a benefit for rural communities across the board, it would be important to ask, well, where are all the subsidies going? And it turns out that about 75% of the subsidies go to about 10% of farmers which means that the benefit of subsidies are really highly concentrated in a small group of farmers. So then it, you, know, you might say, well, then the, the communities where, where those farmers are may be benefited. But it, but it turns out that the larger the farm, the larger the operation, the less likely it is to be spending its money in a local economy. So if you have a, um, a larger farming operation, it's more likely to be purchasing its agricultural inputs from um, national corporations and not from small local businesses. So the money, even if there is a lot of money pouring into a small set of rural communities, isn't necessarily then flowing out into those communities. So this is not to say that there are no benefits, and it's important to note that the, you know, the scope of benefits is going to vary pretty substantially from community to, to community. But I think that you know, these two factors 
problematize the assumption that rural communities are actually benefiting directly from farm subsidies. So what about the rest of the Farm Bill? So this, the surprising result is that it, it turns out that a lot of the other Farm Bill programs are actually much more beneficial to communities than farm subsidies are. So take the conservation program. So there's um, a bunch of money in the Farm Bill that pays farmers either to keep their land out of production or to implement certain kinds of um, more environmentally friendly farming practices. So there are some studies that suggest that these programs actually have substantial benefits for rural communities in a, a somewhat surprising way because the, the initial thought would be, well, they take land out of production, they may decrease farming profits um, if you're using more environmentally friendly practices. But actually, for a lot of communities, these programs end up creating a benefit through increased rural tourism. So the the cleaner the environment in a rural community, the better the environment is for tourists and you get a rise of, of recreational land use and hunting that has lots of economic spillover benefits for rural communities. Um, so next is this, the SNAP program, which is the, the food stamps program. And this is, this is not a program that we think of as being a rural program in particular. Historically, it was primarily an urban program, and it was what brought together a coalition of urban congressmen with rural congressmen to, to create the Farm Bill to begin with. Um, but it, it turns out that um, observers of the um, food system and people who are studying the effects of the Farm Bill on rural economy would point to the SNAP program as the most important Farm Bill program for rural communities. One of the primary reasons is that the benefits are much more evenly distributed. So you have SNAP benefits, and I don't want to say in every rural county across the country, but in, in far more than you have farm benefits. And those benefits actually have a much more direct spillover effect to other kinds of local businesses. So the SNAP money is exclusively spent in, in local grocery stores and convenience stores and any other places where food is sold. So you have this direct spreading of the money from the recipients of the benefit to business owners and um, small, to small businesses in the local community. And finally, and this is the, the fairly obvious one, the, there is also in the Farm Bill a rural development title, which has um, a bunch of money for, um, to subsidize loans for development in rural communities. And it's actually a pretty small, it's about, it totals about 2.5% of Farm Bill spending. So it's a fairly small program, but observers point to it as um, being one of the most important aspects of the Farm Bill for rural development. So um, this is sort of a, a cursory look at all of these programs, but, but the takeaway point is that if what we really care about is the economic health of our rural communities, subsidies for commodities is not the best way to protect that economic health. So I'm going to move on and talk um, for a few minutes about SNAP specifically. So the myth I want to point to here sort of has two layers. The, the first layer is the, the tagline that you hear all the time in the media that the SNAP program is full of waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, and the second layer is more about why is that the tagline. So I, and this, this is a bit more speculative on my part, but the, the myth, I, what I would argue is a myth is that waste, fraud, and abuse is the the primary concern that lawmakers have had in trying to cut um, SNAP funding, or to, to put it another way, that the budget is really what the fight over SNAP funding is all about. So let's let's look at some of the numbers. So waste first. So the error rate in the SNAP program is about 2.77 percent. That's extremely extremely low for a federal program. Now I don't want to under undervalue that. That's still a lot of overpayments that are made. Um, but in comparison, the crop insurance program has an error rate of 4.7%. So that's uh, almost, well, not quite twice, but substantially more. Um, in the House bill that, was, um, that went to the conference committee, there was a provision that would actually have cut bonus payments that the federal government would pay to states to reduce the error rate. Now that provision didn't make it into the final version of the bill, but it suggests that reducing error was not actually a primary concern of legislators. 
Um, so similarly, in the fraud context, and when I say fraud, I mean um, primarily trafficking of food stamps. So when a, a food stamp recipient takes, so, you know, sells the money or in some other way tries to um, sell the benefit, basically to exchange a benefit that you can only exchange for food and get cash from it. So the, the rate of trafficking in the food stamp program is about 1%, which is tiny. So again, by comparison, the rate of fraud in the crop insurance program is closer to 5%. Now that's a sort of a speculative number. There aren't really good studies out there about what the rate is, but there's consensus that the fraud rate for crop insurance is substantially higher than the fraud rate for food stamps. And you might say, you know, so what, it's a much smaller program, and that's, that's true. So in 2012, we spent $75 billion on food stamps, and we only spent about $14 billion on crop insurance. But 5% of uh, $14 billion is almost the same as, as 1% of $75 billion. So in terms of you know, taxpayer money that is lost, they're fairly comparable. And so then the question you have to ask is, why do we hear about food stamp fraud all the time and we never hear about crop insurance fraud? Uh, it's not that legislatures are ignoring it completely. There are provisions in the Farm Bill to try to address crop insurance fraud, but it definitely doesn't have the same kind of media appeal or sort of popular, raise the same kinds of popular concern that food stamp fraud does. The last category is abuse, and I think this is, this is probably the most controversial one. So when lawmakers talk about abuse, what they basically mean is people who are of working age and are not disabled and don't have children who are unemployed and are collecting money under the SNAP system. Now this is perfectly legal. This is the way the system is designed. There are work requirements, uh, and so you, you can't you know, collect this money forever and continue to remain unemployed. Um, but this has been a, a big focal point of the SNAP debate. And it, it turns out from a um, financial perspective that this population of people is a really small population of people collecting SNAP benefits. So about 85% of the households collecting SNAP money have either children or disabled people in them, which means that they're not subject to this, this concern about abuse. Of the remaining group of people who are um, able-bodied working age adults, about 80% of them worked either immediately preceding their collection of SNAP benefits or immediately after, which means that for most people who fall into that category, they're not treating SNAP as a, a long-term system. They're not, so the, there was the news story about the surfer in Santa Monica who was using his food stamp money to buy coconut water and um, uh, sushi. Um, so, you know, it, it was a true story. I don't, I don't want to suggest that, the, you know, the media made that up. But the point is that the people who look like that are a really, really small percentage of the people who are collecting SNAP benefits. So, um, the underlying point here is that, or the underlying question rather, is why are we talking about abuse? What is it that lawmakers and, and the media and um, opponents to SNAP funding are really focused on? So, so what's interesting about um, the House bill is that it actually eliminated, um, it eliminated some job worker training and it eliminated uh, a waiver system that allowed states to reduce the work requirements in times of high unemployment, which was basically the, the essentially suggesting that work requirements are, you know, I would say unconscionable if a person who is eligible actually can't find work because there are no jobs. So my underlying, underlying concern with all of this focus on abuse is that we're, at, we're having the conversation about the wrong thing. So lawmakers are talking about funding and they're talking about um, you know, people taking advantage of the system. But what I think that they really ought to be talking about is um, who deserves SNAP funding to begin with. What, it, what are the values that we're trying to um, implement in creating this program. And I think that that would be a much more honest conversation about reformulating the SNAP program. Unfortunately, a lot of the really draconian measures that were in the House bill are not in the, the final proposal. 
But I think there is a fundamental question about uh, when funding should be available. And now our, our program has determined that it's available when you can't find work and you meet certain income requirements. But our, the media and lawmakers have still called use of the system under those conditions abuse, which I, you know, I think it's obviously a really pejorative word. Uh, and the real question is, should we be providing funding in those circumstances? Now, personally, I think yes, but the, the point that I'm trying to make is that that's what we should be having the conversation about rather than waste, fraud, and abuse, which I think is really a veil for value judgments about who deserves federal funding. Great, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to see a lot of uh, familiar faces. This is where I had my 1L torts class, and so when I sit here, I'm just reminded of Alan Sykes cold calling me after going to Bar Review, and this is just like far superior to uh, <laughs> that kind of arrangement. So uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, Jordan, for putting this together. This is an awesome crowd, um, and uh, great timing, indeed. I think that the negotiators for the Farm Bill ought to consult with Jordan earlier in the process, and figure out when she's going to hold these talks so that they can schedule you know, the conference committee around that. Um, <laughs> it's perfect timing. Um, so there, I, I just, I'm going to keep this pretty brief so that everybody has a chance to ask questions if they're interested. Uh, but it's a good bridge off the last two conversations because now we've talked about both the subsidy side and the nutrition title. Those are the two, those are the two anchors of this piece of legislation and accounts for something like 90% of the spending that happens in the bill. It attracts all of the high-level attention, all of the advocacy efforts. And uh, my talk is basically going to focus on why it's taken so very long to get this bill done, despite the fact that it contains benefits for rural communities or for the farm community, uh, as well as nutrition programs, which are important to urban, suburban, and uh, as Margo mentioned, you know, even uh, even rural communities benefit from the SNAP program. Um, and it's, it's a quite interesting thing for me because I used to work in agriculture and it, it's something that I'm passionate about. But I think it's also interesting because observing the political process and the legislative process for the Farm Bill is somewhat instructive in terms of understanding the current state of the lawmaking process and the public policy arena. Uh, there are a lot of uh, lessons from the Farm Bill that I think are are helpful for us to understand what all is happening in Congress and what all is happening in, in the, the policymaking process, and particularly uh, kind of the breakdown in terms of the legislative process. So I'm going to focus on that. If, if I have a little bit of time, I'll talk about one myth that I think is, is pretty pervasive, but if I can't get to that, uh, maybe we can touch on it in the Q&A. And that, that's the issue of uh, family farmers and agribusiness. And a lot of people think the Farm Bill is just basically handouts for uh, corporate interests, and, and they think that the money is all going to Archer Daniels Midland and John Deere and Monsanto. And uh, there are significant benefits in the Farm Bill for major agribusinesses like that, but the story of how the connection between the, the legislation and those interests is a little bit more complex and, and somewhat interesting to me at least. And so if people want to ask about that, uh, I'm happy to answer questions about that. Um, so this legislation was supposed to be passed in September of 2012 when the 2008 Farm Bill expired. And here we are in uh, February of 2014. Um, you know, Farm Bills typically are pretty popular, pretty bipartisan pieces of legislation. Um, because they contain the farm programs, they contain nutrition, they contain rural development, conservation, there's, it, there's something like of a Christmas tree nature. There's something for everybody. People string on the ornaments that they want and it ends up being a 1,000 pages long and costing a trillion dollars. And members of Congress say, yep, yeah, that's great. There's something in it for my constituency. And in fact, if you look at the history of vote tallies on the Farm Bill, you see very, very wide bipartisan majorities, at least in recent history. So the 1996 Farm Bill passed by a 318 to 89 margin in the House and the 74 to 26 margin in the Senate. The 02 bill passed by a 280 to 141 margin in 64 to 35 in the Senate. And the 08 Farm Bill passed by a 318 to 106 margin in the House and an 81 to 15 margin in the Senate. All of those votes were highly bipartisan. In fact, 
The 2008 Farm Bill was vetoed twice by President Bush, and Congress twice overrode the veto. So I think that shows that there's this history of bipartisanship. Uh, and this bill passed, as, as uh, Priya mentioned earlier, by a 68 to 32 margin in the Senate and 251 to 166 in the House. So given all that support, what's going on? Why was this bill particularly difficult to pass? And I can point to four factors, essentially, that um, made this legislative process unique and uniquely difficult for lawmakers. Uh, first was the overall budget environment for uh, you know, our, our national debt and our federal deficits. Second, changing demographics in terms of on farm and in rural America. Third, increased partisanship in Congress. And then as a result of those three main factors, uh, there's a fourth factor, which is that it became more difficult during this farm bill process for the grand coalition that has typically supported farm bills, that being the nutrition community or the nutrition title and the farm title, to coalesce and generate enough support to make a push through the legislative process. So I'm going to go through those real quickly. Um, so during the debate on the 96 and 2002 farm bills, uh, Congress was dealing with a far rosier budget picture, both in terms of real facts as well as perception in terms of the role of the deficit for our national economy. So in 1995, when the Budget Committee was giving uh, congressional authorizers a total amount of funding that they could use to authorize a bill, the U.S. had a, a $164 billion deficit. In 2001, during the same stage in the legislative process, the U.S. enjoyed a $127 billion budget surplus. You can contrast that with the lead up to the 2012 Farm Bill, uh, where the U.S. was uh, running an annual deficit of over a trillion dollars, and the national debt from 96 to 2012 had gone from about $5 trillion up to $9.5 trillion or so. If you look at it as a share of GDP, uh, not massive changes, although I think as we all can observe with the rise of the Tea Party, uh, there's been a a fairly significant change in terms of the discussion of, of the importance of cutting deficits and being responsible in legislation. So the authorizers this time around had far less money to work with. There are some constraints in terms of the total amount of money that could go into the bill. And whereas the 96 and 02 bill were kind of expansions in federal spending, the people who are draft, the members of Congress drafting the 2012 bill started from the assumption that there were going to be cuts. And of course, uh, when there are cuts, there are hard decisions to be made, and it puts people into a zero-sum situation. And in this particular case, it pitted the nutrition interests of maintaining the SNAP program against the farm program interests, which wanted to see you know, maintenance of a safety net for farmers and ranchers. Um, and at the beginning of the process, uh, the White House had identified about 30 billion dollars in cuts, 30 to 40 billion dollars in cuts that needed to be made. House Republicans identified about 40 billion in cuts that would need to be made to the nutrition title, to the SNAP program, uh, through the draconian measures that we talked about earlier. And the Senate Democrats had a kind of a balanced picture of let's reduce spending, we might have to make some tweaks to the nutrition title, but let's also reform the farm program and kind of share, share the, the hard times. So these, these pressures led to delays. They led to a lot of uh, uh, fights, food fights between the different interests. Um, thank you for that courtesy laugh. <laughs> um, so the second factor I want to talk about is, uh, is the political potency of the farm interest. Um, we talked about the history of these programs. They started during the New Deal. And when you look at the percentage of Americans who lived on the farm, lived in rural communities, the share of the national economy that agriculture made up. These, this, was a major, this was a major deal. Uh, we're talking about 25 to 30 percent of Americans uh, you know, living on the farm or living in farm, like major farm dependent counties. Um, you know, 20 percent of employment, 15 to 20 percent of our GDP. Today those numbers are significantly different. Um, there are about 2.9 million Americans who farm in some capacity, so 1 to 2 percent of Americans. Um, there were 6.5 million farms uh, during World War II. Today we have about 2 million farms. The, the number of individuals and the number of farm businesses have shrunk significantly. 
and uh, the share of GDP, national GDP for agriculture, is like between 0.8% and 1%. So it's a relatively small sector now. It drives less of the national economy. And if you talk to national policymakers and national economic experts, there's far less interest in the price of cotton relative to the ongoing WTO disputes over steel or something like that. Um, that being said, there, there are still some pockets of the United States where agriculture remains a dominant industry. If you look at states like North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and Nebraska, agriculture makes up 5 to 8% of those state uh, economies. If you look at the people who are on the Senate and House Agriculture Committees or the leaders of those committees, they tend to be from those states. So it kind of makes sense. And we can understand that the amount of representation for those farm-dependent counties has shrunk in the House, and of course their ability to influence national policymaker. policymaking has also uh, decreased significantly. Um, the third factor I mentioned is increased partisanship. We all kind of observe that. We see that stuff in the newspaper. But just to put a point on it to, with regard to agriculture policy making, it's very typical, and I saw this when I was working on the Hill, uh, to see Republican and Democrat members from the same state to work together uh, and share common positions. You'd see this between someone like Senator Chuck Grassley, a very conservative Republican in Iowa, and Tom Harkin, who's a very uh, progressive Democrat, also from Iowa, would share many of the same positions, would typically vote in lockstep on agriculture policymaking. This has changed pretty significantly. Um, whereas the, the farm bill process used to be a matter of compromise between regions, the cotton growers compromising with corn growers, Today, it looks a little bit more like the you know, taxpayers for common sense fighting uh, the Center for Budget Policy Priorities about the relative merits of cutting programs or keeping programs. And so as a result, um, the House, in fact, in July had a vote on the Farm Bill in which they split altogether the, the agriculture programs from the nutrition programs. And the House leadership lost a vote on the floor. Um, there was a vote in which 216 Republicans voted yes and zero Democrats voted yes, a completely partisan vote. Um, and you had members of Congress like uh, Rep. Hulskamp from Kansas, who represented one of the major agriculture counties in the United States, voting no on a piece of legislation uh, on a farm bill. And one commentator said, quote, that vote would have been unheard of even as recently as the 2008 Farm Bill. So I think you see some increased polarization and, uh, and pressure, particularly on conservative Republicans, to figure out how to vote on this piece of legislation. And so to, to summarize, um, you, the combination of those three elements basically put a huge amount of strain on the grand coalition that typically works together to push a Farm Bill through the very difficult legislative process here, that coalition was um, significantly frayed. Um, you see uh, leaders of these two communities recognize that they need each other. So the president of the American Farm Bureau Federation said, quote, in our opinion, if you separate the two, meaning the two titles, you would no longer have a farm bill. Uh, the agriculture community increasingly recognizes that they need the nutrition title. And they need those urban members of Congress and those votes in order to get a bill through the process because of the budget pressures, because of the partisanship, um, and because of, what did I say was the other factor? The decline in, in uh, the potency of rural interests. You had a very difficult time bringing those uh, two groups together and getting a coalition to move a bill. So I, I, it's good that we have one. It's good for certainty for farmers. It's good for, um, you know, to see actually something move through the legislative process, but I think this bill goes to show why it's so difficult today uh, to move anything through Congress, and um, uh, hopefully it, it bodes well for other reforms that, or other pieces of legislation that I think a lot of us would like to see move through Congress during this term, but uh, kind of a difficult legislative window. So I'll just leave it at that so that there's plenty of time for questions, and uh, thanks again for being here. A round of questions. I'll start with uh, Christine. Uh, people often say that the 
the title Farm Bill is a bit of a misnomer that perhaps it should be called the Food Bill just because like, almost 75% of the money that's actually allocated by it goes to food and nutrition programs. And in light of what you said about some of the national, you know, the health problems that our country's facing, like the obesity epidemic, and then the insane amount of money that's actually going towards food and nutrition in the Farm Bill, to what degree do you feel like there are, the Farm Bill sort of has potential solutions to uh, some of these, these issues? Yeah, so that was actually the, the back half of my talk, if I had more time. Um, so I, that was one of the things that I was really interested in looking at when I was um, first starting out with the Farm Bill. Um, we knew that SNAP was a big chunk of the, the bill and the appropriations. Um, and that I would consider by itself a huge um, health and nutrition program. Um, if people don't have enough money to buy groceries of any type, um, they're certainly not going to be able to buy healthy foods um, that, that they need to be eating. Um, but there are a bunch of little programs in there that, um, and policies in there that are um, really useful in our efforts to increase access to healthy foods. Um, there are now in the new farm bill, um, there's new, a new incentive program um, tied to SNAP to incentivize fruit and vegetable purchases. Um, there was a pilot program of that in the previous farm bill and now um, there's an expansion of, of trying to support some local efforts that we're seeing around the country to double SNAP benefits at farmers markets and, um, and even to double um, benefits at grocery stores if you buy fruits and vegetables. Um, so that's one. Um, there's a number of programs that support um, local and regional food systems. So things like the Community Food Projects um, grant program, which funds kind of small, innovative uh, kind of demonstration projects to try to connect people to their local food system. Um, even the rural development title, which really focuses on economic development in rural communities, has loan and grant programs that can be used to start any kind of business, but um, one of the things that we point people towards is, is they could be used to start food retail businesses, grocery stores in rural communities. They could be used to um, create kind of healthy food um, production businesses and that could then sell into um, grocery stores and, and increase access. Um, fresh fruit and vegetable program is a um, fresh fruit and vegetable snack program um, provides fruits and vegetables to low-income schools um, around the country um, and serve something like six or 700,000 kids a day. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of other things that people don't really talk about. Uh, Margo, I'm curious, because your background is in environmental law, what the sustainability implications of, of the new bill are, and in particular, um, the end of these direct payments and the shift to the crop insurance subsidies, how much sense it makes from an environmental perspective to rely on those as the primary uh, subsidy mechanism? So it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag for the environment and the new farm bill. I'll start with maybe the best thing that the new farm bill does for the environment, which for the first time it connects um, crop insurance payments or subsidies to farmers with some certain conservation compliance. So this, since 1985, to get any of the subsidy commodity um, payments, you had to comply with some very basic environmental conditions. So they, they related to wetlands. You couldn't, if you converted wetlands, you weren't eligible for commodity payments and highly erodible lands. If you wanted to farm on highly erodible land, you had to have a, con a soil conservation plan in place. So there, there are two very basic environmental protection provisions. And until this new farm bill, you didn't need to comply with those things to get crop insurance. So that's a, a big victory for the environmental interests that that connection was finally put into place. And it's especially important because crop insurance is becoming one of the most important subsidies in the farm bill. It's the, it, there's a, a bit of a shift to put the primary emphasis on crop insurance in a way as since we've eliminated direct payments. But crop insurance generally, I, I would say, is not particularly great for the environment, primarily because it reduces risk for farmers. The, the idea behind crop insurance is that a certain level of 
income is essentially guaranteed regardless of the outcome of the season. So um, producers actually have to choose between two types of crop insurance. One is related just to the price. So if the price drops, you're, you're guaranteed to be brought back up to a certain price level. The other is more yield-based. So if, the, if your yield drops because of some kind of environmental catastrophe or flood or drought or pest, you can get the same level of income you would have otherwise. So that's bad for the environment, right? Because farmers, if they have like that guarantee, don't have the same kinds of incentives that they would otherwise have to farm in a more resilient way. So they can abandon all kinds of practices that they would feel were necessary if their income were dependent solely on um, their production. So some of those practices could include um, diversifying their crops or um, using contour farming on, on slopes. So there, there are all of these measures that they could take to make their production more resilient that they don't have any incentive to take if they're guaranteed certain levels. So I, I think a crop insurance system that doesn't move beyond those two really basic conservation requirements that I mentioned earlier is in the long run really bad for the environment. Oh, and, I, and just one other small note, on the, in the conservation programs, there are all of these programs that provide what are called green payments, which pay farmers to have better practices. There is still quite a lot of funding in the new Farm Bill for those programs, but the total amount of acres that can be enrolled in those programs has been cut, I think, from about 12 million new acres a year down to 10 million. So that's a, a substantial loss, too. Uh, and David, I'm, I'm actually curious about the fourth myth. Um, <laughs> if you could talk a little briefly about, um, is, the, is the farm bill just catering to, to agribusiness? Sure. So, um, so I think it's like one of the most common things you read about when you read an op-ed criticizing the farm bill is that it's corporate welfare or it's a giveaway to giant agribusinesses. I mean, just basically any New York Times or Washington Post op-ed that discusses this piece of legislation is just guaranteed to have those watchwords. You're just you're going to see them every time, and so I think that paints a picture for observers that basically Congress is legislating these programs that provide benefits, and they're going directly into the pockets of Monsanto, Cargill, ADM, Bungie, Deer, etc. Um, entities that are then uh, farming and are responsible for raising our food in the United States. Um, you also see this type of commentary in Michael Pollan's books when he talks about. All of our food comes from industrial agribusinesses. Um, just this is kind of interesting to me, and it's not very accessible to folks that don't work in in this policy arena. But 90, basically, 96 percent of all farms in the United States are owned by families and owned by individuals, and they're non they're corporations in the sense that they're incorporated in the same sense that uh, Sam and Bob's shoe store on. Uh, El Camino are, are, is an incorporated entity or is a registered business. I and mean, these are, in fact, kind of sophisticated business enterprises, but they're owned by individuals. They're not owned by multinational corporations like the ones that I just mentioned. Um, and even though I, perhaps what these columns are and what these commentators are discussing is the fact that there is an increasing concentration in terms of the, num the number of farms that are in the United States. I mentioned this. The corollary to that is that average farm size is increasing as well. So if you look at World War II, that period, the average farm size might have been 150 to 200 acres. That was enough acreage in order to have a profitable farm business. Today, that depending on which type of average you're looking at, it, it's between 500 and 1,000 acres. Many, and like others have talked about here too, there is also an increasing concentration of payments, um, and the 65 to 70 percent of payments for just 10 percent of the farmers is a statistic that's commonly used, and it's correct. Uh, these programs are all oriented toward based on acreage, so the largest acreage you have, the more payment you receive. Um, there's some debate in the literature whether the programs are exacerbating or not exacerbating that trend, but a lot of it is related to just uh, technological change and increasing consolidation, which you just have across the economy um, as technology becomes important and uh, the world becomes a more competitive place where you now have Brazil and China and 
parts of Europe and, and Canada, in fact, and New Zealand and Australia engaged in the same type of agricultural industry that we have in the United States. Uh, the lesson is sort of get big or, or get out, and there is a, a small secondary trend, which is get specialized um, and go directly to the consumer. Um, so that's happening at the same time. But when we're talking about the industrial agriculture complex, um, we're talking about large, large and growing family farms that are then getting more and more payments. The way that the, the large multinational agribusiness concerns kind of profit from this piece of legislation is that the bill uh, generally shifts a huge amount of risk from in agriculture, which is an inherently risky business. It fluctuates based on weather, which is out of farmer's control. It fluctuates based on international price changes, which again are outside the farmer's control. It shifts a lot of that risk to the government. Um, and farm businesses like livestock companies that are feeding their animals agricultural products and the processors like the Archer Daniels Midland and Cargill are really dependent on a huge bountiful supply of available products so that they can feed it to their pigs and cows and turn it into high fructose corn syrup and ethanol and other things that they then sell for a value add. Um, and so those, those entities are not largely going to members' offices and advocating for change X or change Y. They're really interested in a farm policy that basically pr provides a lot of risk management tools to farmers so that we have a vibrant agriculture sector in the United States. And so what they end up doing is supporting grower-based organizations like the American Farm Bureau Federation, the National Corn Growers Association, the American Soybean Association, and others by sponsoring their annual conferences, by making large donations, and just sort of staying involved in the policy making process from like kind of a, an arms reach approach, but they're not involved in the direct lobbying kind of day to day. And there are a couple of exceptions to that where you have major industry like the crop insurance industry, the dairy industry, and the sugar industry really involved in the hand-to-hand -hand tactics uh, on the Hill and in the administration trying to advocate for change. So it, it's kind of a, I, you, you just hear agribusiness and you just think these are programs that are going right into the pockets of major, more, major corporations and they are benefiting them, but the way that it's happening is sort of a complex web of uh, sort of influence and money, which I find to be uh, quite interesting. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, I'll just go ahead and call. Maybe you can say your name and affiliation. Great. Uh, my name is Mikhail. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so I guess I should say I'm on the board of the Stanford Latino Law Students Association. And one of the reasons that we were happy to co-sponsor this uh, panel was that there is a particular link between poverty and obesity, especially uh, when it comes to the communities of color and low-income communities generally. So I wanted to ask how we can try to reverse that trend, because it seems to be a cruel irony that the people with the least amount to eat are also the most obese and unhealthy. And I think Christine mentioned a couple of new ideas, I think, that were just put into this farm bill or maybe have been talked about, such as doubling uh, SNAP benefits if you shop at a farmer's market or something like that. So is there any data available that shows us what's the most effective method within the mechanics of the farm bill and which strategies should advocates sort of uh, who care about this issue uh, rally around? Good question. And right um, in the middle of what we do at, at Change Lab. Um, so in the, I would say over the last 10 years, um, there's been a lot of investment in communities kind of experimenting with different ways to get particularly low-income people and communities of color access to healthy food and to make it as easy and cheap as possible to, to eat healthily. Um, and, and we're still, we're kind of just now getting the first waves of evaluation and being able to really say conclusively what, what really drives people consistently to eat healthily and to limit their intake of, of sugar-sweetened beverages and other things. Um, so I would say that overall, we still don't, there's not like a silver bullet of this is what we need to do. Um, within the farm bill, I would say the, the biggest conversations are around um, the SNAP program and um, whether or not we should incentivize healthy food purchases or we should limit um, what people can buy with SNAP. So um, SNAP, SNAP is a, a program, unlike the WIC program, if you know anything about the WIC program, um, it's for women who are pregnant. Um, 
or uh, have young children. And um, it has a very defined set of foods that you can purchase um, with your WIC vouchers. Um, the SNAP program is different in that you can pretty much buy any food um, with a little, a few very minor exceptions and no alcohol or tobacco. Um, any food, so you just get a, a um, you know, a chunk of money each month that you can spend at the grocery store. And, um, and so there's been conversations in the public health community, well, you know, maybe we should prohibit sugar sweetened beverage purchases from, uh, for people participating in the SNAP program. And that's hugely controversial. Um, the anti-hunger community is, which uh, supports the SNAP program and is the main kind of lobbyist for it um, in the farm bill, um, feels like it's paternal, overly paternalistic, um, that it is insulting to people who are on SNAP that we have to now tell them what they can and can't purchase. Um, so that's still an open question. And a number of states and cities have asked for a waiver from the USDA to um, just try it and just see what happens. And the USDA thus far has denied waivers and, and really pointed to Congress needing to tell them that they can do that. Um, so that's one angle. In the last Farm Bill, there was a pilot project called the Healthy Incentive uh, Purchase Pilot or something like that. And um, that was uh, a pilot for one community in Massachusetts to incentivize healthy food purchases at grocery stores for SNAP participants. And there was a whole evaluation mechanism set up and we still don't have evaluation <laughs> results from that. It got, was slow to get started and, um, and so we're still waiting for that. But it sounds like a version of that has now been um, put into the, the farm bill. The, the last thing I want to add, which is an idea that not a lot of people talk about, is um, SNAP has very minimal requirements for what retail stores have to offer in order to accept SNAP. So if, I don't know if you've ever been to a gas station or 7-Eleven, um, and it says, we accept CalFresh or you know EBT or whatever. Um, and I've seen that and been shocked when I go in to see what, what's there. Um, and that's because there's very minimal, minimal requirements. And so I'm very interested in, in trying to strengthen, use that as a, a way of getting um, particularly smaller stores to offer a broader variety of healthy products um, by tying it to their ability to accept SNAP. Um, and there's been a little bit of progress made in this most recent farm bill, although it's, it's still, I think, not as far as we could go um, in trying to create an environment where people can find more healthy products. Can I add one, one small thing to that? So I don't want to minimize at all the importance of um, continuing to fight on a policy level to address the sugary drink problem and encourage healthy eating and, and healthy activity. But I, I do want to add that there's been a lot of research recently that complicates what we know about why people become obese. And it points towards a, a cause that isn't really in the public policy focus at all, which is environmental toxins. So there are growing links now between things like BPA, which is in most of our um, food containers and water bottles and things like that, that the exposure to BPA at certain stages, um, especially in um, prenatal can predispose people to obesity no matter how they eat or what kind of healthy behavior they engage in their lives. So I, I think going forward there's going to be a growing need for um, environmental justice advocates to focus on obesity because there, there is a um, correlation between poverty and exposure to certain kinds of environmental toxins. So I think going forward that's going to be a really important policy avenue as well. I think, unfortunately, that ends our Q&A session. Uh, but I'm sure the panelists would be happy to stick around for a few minutes uh, sure. to chat with anyone who has questions. So thank you again.